Hi, my name is Blair Barnett and welcome to this forum. Uh, before we start, I want to tell you a little bit more about the British Film Designers Guild. The BFDG is a flourishing professional group of talented individuals who have spent over 630 accredited memberships of skilled creatives, production designers, spanning the various branches of the art department in TV, film and commercials. It was formed over 75 years ago with the aim of raising the standards and the profile of the art department and protecting the interests of its members. It's now the leading collective of art department colleagues in the UK. Just wanted to give you a little bit of more information about that before we start talking to the absolutely fantastic Jeremy Reed about his experience designing for commercials. Hello, Jeremy. Hi Blair, how are you? Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah. uh, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a production designer? Sure. sure. Um, hi everyone, I'm English. I don't, I don't live in England. I live, I live in the States. I live in Los Angeles. Uh, I was born, born in England, but I grew up in a country called Zimbabwe. Uh, yeah. yeah in the colonies and then i came to london did my o levels and a levels at school in north london and then i had to go back to zimbabwe and do national service because we had them at the time and after that i attended university in the states where i went to study history because that was my favorite subject at school and i discovered this other thing called architecture and it kind of tore me away from everything else and because of that I suppose love for architecture. I, I find myself doing this now. I feel very fortunate. Um, I sort of had a very informal training through college, and I'm still trying to teach myself things about architecture as I move along. That's basically it. Uh, I live with my family in Los Angeles, like I said, and right now I'm in Philadelphia making a movie. And it's very hot and very, very small. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, that's about it. Thank you. That's a nice circuitous route in. Um, I started uh, studying chemistry. So it's funny, you don't have to actually just grow up going, oh, I want to be a production designer. Although as soon as I realized it was a job that people actually got paid to do this, I was like, there's literally nothing else I can do. But yeah, I studied chemistry first. So there's lots of different routes into the industry as you have so displayed. Yeah, it's funny when I first, um, when I left college and came to Los Angeles, the first job I had was working in a restaurant. Um, and uh, the reason I brought this up is that these English men used to come in and they were production designers and I had no idea who they were and what they did. And one was this very famous guy called Ashton Gordon, who, um, who worked with Ridley Scott. And there was another guy called Brian Eatwell, who I had the pleasure of working with his daughter, Joanna, Joanna Eatwell, a year ago on a movie in Ireland. And these chaps, you know, I say, what, what on earth do you do? And they would try and explain it to me. So it's quite a rare, it's amazing that I've actually come and I'm doing what they were talking to me about. And I was rather unknowledgeable. I, I said, oh my gosh, it sounds like the most difficult thing on the planet. And here we are. It can be, it can be a bit harrowing when you think about it as a whole, because it happens so fast and you have to really kind of, you know, trust your instincts and put, put a plan in place before you even know what you're doing. Um, and it is breaking it down into this step by step by step by step. It's taken me, you know, half a century for me to relax and think about things like that. Um, <clears throat> but um, so let's talk about Gucci Aria commercial, which is won the BFDG's best production design award for commercials this year. It's absolutely stunningly beautiful. And I would just like to hear a little bit more about your experience. Absolutely. Um, well, firstly, we shot the job last year during the during the covid uh lockdown so i had i just come off a feature so i did some of the work in la then i had to go to rome and when i went to rome it was in lockdown I, there were two police officers who met me off the plane the reason being they had to get me into the country through customs because <laughs> customs would have probably put me into you know isolation quarantine um and i had to go straight to the stage to start building the set because we had very very little time to do this maybe and I'd managed to assemble a fantastic crew from all around Europe. I had people from Italy. We were shooting at Cinecita. I had crew from Belgium, art department crew, and I also had crew from, from France. 
Um, and I, so I assemble these. I mean, I the reason this job looks the way it is is because of these brilliant people I worked with. I was standing on the shoulders of giants. Okay, so um, what was interesting was the reason we're shooting this all on stages because of the COVID limitations. Gucci could not do any fashion shows because no one would have gone to them, and they certainly wouldn't have been able to have the models, you know, standing around working within close uh, quarters. So the whole idea was to build this on on stage, and we had this set you're looking at now, which is actually a street we built. And it's I found out that the founder of Gucci worked in London at a club called the Savoy. Not the hotel, but it was called the Savoy Club. This is where he started out as a teenager. And he was always very proud of this fact. So we built the street and we built this little area because this is where the journey starts. Somebody walks down the street, goes through that door, and it takes us into all the other worlds. Um, I was having problems trying to find cobbles, the right cobblestone, cobblestone skins. Um, and it was solved very quickly. They just brought in cement trucks and we just poured cement all over the stage and stamped it that night. It took a night to do it. And obviously when anyone walks across it, you get a wonderful echo, which you never would have got with, a, with an actual skin. I, I love the way it turned out and, and it held this, it had to have a wet down. And because of the unevenness of the pour, it held the water very well. And there was wonderful areas, pockets, where we saw the reflections of the neon sign in the street. So um, I, I was very happy the way that turned out. And I was very happy uh, with what came here, the way it was lit, et cetera. And then basically our model comes across and goes through that door, which is under the V, and he comes into this little area. Mm. Okay, which was a corridor, you know, based on the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, except it's full of cameras. Um, in lieu of the paparazzi who were paparazzi, <laughs> it's meant to be metaphorical for the you know the eye that's viewing the fashion etc and i think this was every camera that was available in rome <laughs> we had them there and basically the models like this young lady here they walk up and down and that was our fashion show that was how they did this um it was a contained stage and it enabled them to get all their, all the latest line out. And then when they got to the end of this corridor, there was a little blackened room and they went through a door and then they came into this incredible, this garden. Um, when, now, if you look at the very top uh, drawing, that's actually a map painting. And um, we use the Unreal Engine for this set. So I had a 240 foot curved LED wall mm. and all the weeping willows, et cetera, were assets that were placed in the Unreal Engine and moved around, except the, the ornate Italianate villa um, that was actually built and it's in the garden and the garden was around 120 feet deep, you know, whatever, 180 foot wide. And that's where the models then went and interacted with white horses for other and other animals um, and they we had some hidden trampolines in the floor so it would look like they were bouncing up and down magically from the grass uh of, when you see some of the stills i mean it looks massive but this was the first time i'd ever worked with unreal engine and i i can see why people are excited about it obviously um I don't know if any of you have ever operate. I have. I am the first idea. I know there were twenty four operators, and I had to sit with them and, and ask them how they could, you know, they could move the assets around. And that's what they call all these elements, assets. Um, so I don't know what, if you got something else after this, Blair. Let's have a look. The next one. Oh, so, there we go. So this is this is a shot of the actual garden. And this is how it looked in front of the camera. And I wow. think it's, it seems like it has incredible depth. And that's thanks to the Unreal Engine. It's about 120 foot deep, but the LED screen helps. You know, it's not green screen, it's magnificent. It's a great tool. So if you get to work with it, enjoy it. God, that's and fantastic. It's, yeah. And it's, it's unusual for a commercial 
to spend that kind of money because those those unreal engine screens are very very expensive so i felt very fortunate it's absolutely stunning uh, what what kind of what prompted the idea for the garden and the ideas for it? like where did you draw your inspiration from that um, i do well i i looked at capability brown and i looked at all the great french gardeners um the reason again we're in a garden not not in real woods is they couldn't they wouldn't allow us into a real wood in rome it, it, everything was verboten so it's fine we got to build it on stage and i had this incredible parisian greensman who'd worked was it who uh, he's done some fantastic stuff and just working with him was astonishing and everything he came up with and his team so again i felt very very fortunate but again it, it came it comes from the great french gardens and of course the english the english have got great gardens too oh, oh indeed <laughs> And I've got to ask, um, for such a fashion brand, what was it like working directly with the head of Gucci, Alessandro Michel? What was um, that like? Okay, okay, okay. He's very nice. Um, he was co-directing, the lady who was the director is a lady called Floria Sigismondi. Um, she lives in Los Angeles, and I just finished a movie with her in, in Ireland, literally a week before, um, a period piece, a medieval period piece. So we went off together and Alessandro was the co-director. Now, obviously, he's the head of Gucci. He, he has the final say on everything. And I tell you, for those of you who do commercials, you know, you know about the dynamics of the agency and the client. Um, and I don't know, I've been in this since the turn of the century and the dynamics have changed a lot. They, there was a time when directors really had a lot of power and they had a lot of say what, and when they discussed something with their team, the DP and the production designer, it tended to stick. And then a little bit, about around 2008, you might remember the world kind of fell apart because of some Icelandic guy, Magnus Magnuson, mm -hmm. sort of billions of dollars that he couldn't pay back. And afterwards, the agency and the client started to get the power because people were fighting over the scraps. They all, you know, production companies were underbidding each other. This was certainly what was happening in Los Angeles. So as they, they suddenly started taking more control of what was going on, which meant that the commercials were made to cater to the Midwest of America. I, I call it the, um, the, the blue button down shirt sort of brigade. Um, okay. And a lot of the mad creativity that had been up till then, the, people like David Fincher, when they were doing commercials, they were doing amazing stuff. It changed a bit. So what this this commercial I thought was like a once in a million job. I just thought nothing like this would ever come along again. And to work with the head of the the head of the brand, you can actually go up to him and say something, and he'd listen, and he'd clap his hand and go, "Yes, we're going to do that." And there was no there was no um, we didn't have to go through twenty different people. He made the decision on the spot, and that was the best thing about working with Alessandro Michel, who is the head of Gucci. And this is where this is where the model um, goes in. He's going through the first room, and he's about to walk into the white, the white, the white corridor, which is full of cameras. Yeah, and I think there are about ninety-one other models that followed him. So we had so we saw ninety-two different costumes, and then we moved on because the original one. They did a 15, 13, 13 minute version. They did the one minute version, then did a 13 minute version, which is very long. And they spend a lot more time in each set. But uh, I think the one minute version tells the story too, quite well. And it's a random question, but uh, horses, was that a, did that cause any problems, any, well, any I, interesting? I gotta tell you, the horses, they came in and they did their thing. <laughs> they run across the set and then i, I remember it, we were, it was very late at night i think we shot we shot from eight in the morning this was the last day we shot from eight in the morning till three o'clock in the morning um and i remember just turning to my right and the two horses are just standing there <laughs> they're just standing there totally unattended just standing by the side of the stage as calm as anything and you could just walk over to them and stroke them I was, it was like you didn't even realize they were there and they were just so well behaved they were great and these 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 those other these chaps, oh, there's there were all the animals behave very well. 
that's not what you hear about animals. No, <laughs> that that I mean, yeah, the models were worse, way, way worse behaved than the animals were. <laughs> Apparently, you're not supposed to feed either. Yeah, I think I think a couple actually fell in love. There was a kissing scene where um, one of the male models swirls another young lady around, and the kiss was only meant to last for a couple of seconds, and it didn't. And I hear I hear now that they're I think they're engaged or something, and I'm not what? making it. So well, nice, that's nice a little side story. It's in the you can see it. The guy, the guy's swan. Anyway, it's nice. I like to hear stories. Like that. It's just absolutely gorgeous and um, Thank yeah, you. really stunning. But um, you, you kind of touched on it earlier, but how, um, how have commercials changed over time? Because I remember they're, they're being, you know, quite staid and like when I, was, when I was growing up, everything was really high. This is this and this is what I'm going to show you. And there wasn't really a narrative in storytelling. And then through the 90s, things got a little bit kind of surreal um and and now they're like you've got tom ford and you know you got people doing whole films that is a exactly. brand new content and you even uh um you've got happenings and you know interactive things that are essentially commercials um but how how you know how can you narrate your experience how that's gone through time no, you're exactly right it's the people who come in the creative minds that come in and set the tone like you mentioned tom ford he comes in he does something that's never been done before and it does well it's successful you know his brand does well it in it 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 makes people braver they feel that they don't have to stick to the middle of the road stuff that everybody in the midwest wants to see they know if they take a chance with their visuals they go more surreal they go more stylized hyper real that they can still do very well and i know and and it's Everybody wants those jobs. Every director wants those jobs, and the agencies are writing them. But that you know, they'll go out to a very few people. They'll go out to some. They'll go out to David Fincher. They'll go out to Tom Ford. They'll go out to some, you know, Christopher Nolan. There'll be two or three feature film directors who do very creative work that they'll approach. And there might be a couple of creative um, commercial chaps. The guy, remember Tim Walker is the name. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I, I remember that. I meant to yeah. text you about that, Tim Walker. So yes, he's what, been a big inspiration to so me. When these people are around and they're doing they're doing commercials, there's a sudden everything goes up, everything's elevated, and there's little there's there's little moments where this where there's a spurt, um, but they're not always there. They're not always available. They they have very busy lives. They're back doing feature films, or like or Tom Ford might be doing his clothing line, and Alessandro Michelle, you know, he's never. He never set out to be a film director. You know, so he's he's the head of a of a fashion house. So yeah, you, know, you get these people who come in, and the director Floria Sigismondi, bless her heart, is an incredibly creative person, and that's you know a massive reason why this commercial is so beautiful, because her work. If you go back and look at Floria's work, um, you know she made her name with a god you know with the music videos back in the 1990s mid 1990s and the, the, the visually they were stunning and she, you know she's carried on that in her commercial work and she's carried it on in her feature film work so there are very there are very few of these people there because what happens is i think a lot of a lot of directors and commercials consider themselves comedy experts yeah. they, they like to do comedy so comedy is not visually stimulating, you know, it's, and those jobs are often about the gag, you know, what makes people laugh. And it's not about gorgeous sets. They, they are second. I mean, it's like watching an Alan, Adam Sandler movie. Uh, they're not, it's not about the art direction. It's about what's happening, you know, between the characters and that's comedy for you. And I think 90, 95% of commercials in Los Angeles where I live are, are comedy based. And you don't get these serious dramatic pieces and i think gucci was a little bit serious a little bit dramatic you know and i look and and the stuff that I, I i saw great stuff at the um at the award show there was there was a there was comedy in in the spots but they also they looked visually amazing you know the production designers that did them were so talented um but i think it's the comedy is always going to be 
what they go towards because they, they realize people want to have a chuckle. Um, and there's going to be less of the surreal, hyper real commercial, sadly. I mean, I wish that everyone was like David Fincher. You know, I wish every director was trying to emulate that. I wish they were all trying to do that in commercials. They'd be, it'd be brilliant. But it's just, you know, it's a brand. They're trying to sell it. That's what comes first. They sell a car and it's how well it drives. It's not the beautiful set. It's just life. I remember um, the first commercial I saw that was super cinematic. I can't remember the director's name. It was a Levi's commercial that came out in yeah. maybe the late 90s. I think it's um, Jonathan Glazier. What's that? I think it's Jonathan Glazier, the guy who did Sexy Beast. Is, oh, was it? It really stuck in my head because it was advertising that little tiny pocket that you've got in the front. Everybody's like, what's that little pocket from? And they, they, they showed a guy buying condoms and he put his condom in it and he goes to a house and then uh, he picks up the daughter and the guy who sold him the condom is the father of the daughter. And he's just left thinking there like, oh, what? I remember that. But, oh my God. Uh, but it was really beautiful. It was so beautifully shot. It was such a narrative. I think it was in black and white, wasn't it? It was, it was in black and white. It was gorgeous. Yep. And the guy's got some overalls on. I don't know. Exactly. See, it sticks in your head. You know? um, and that I remember thinking, oh my gosh, commercials could be epic. They could be cinematic. Mm -hmm. And that was the first commercial that made me start wanting to do commercials. Because uh, up until then, I thought, oh, this is just something that you do for money when you're not working. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, so, a lot of these, a lot of the directors in California, that's all they'll ever do are commercials. Really? They, don't, they don't do TV. Oh, they'd all love to do become a feature film director, but it's 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 a hard step up, it would seem, for a lot of them. Very. I mean, David Fincher. I using his name again. He's an example of somebody who crossed over. Um, was uh, there's there's been a few of them, um, but not many. Not many. Um, a lot a lot a lot have tried, and you know they do one film, and it's one striking out. And what they're worried about is doing a film that doesn't do well. It's it hurts their commercial career. So some of them would rather just play safe. Yeah. Um, rather than take the take the chance and have everything they've built up, you know, backfire. Um, so that's yeah. That's that one. Well, it's also you've got this product, right? That you have to like keep in mind. That's the star of the show. And everything else uh is 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 used to create to elevate this product and usually the people behind the product might not be the most creative or the most visually stimulated they're trying to get there there's that famous um scene in mad men if you watch that where they're trying to think of all these really great things to do with with beans trying to sell heinz beans and the client just knocks them all down and said what's wrong with a bowl of beans and a spoon i mean that's what we've always done do you know and so that's what uh, that's you know you hear that all the time when you're working on commercials it's like clients like well i just want to put this right in front of it like do it as a pack shot do this and you're like oh this would be more interesting to have all this it must be really incredibly hard to summon up all these creative elements and all this inspiration from other place to kind of make a commercial not a commercial to make something great not about the beans but yeah. still want to get the beans like how do you overcome that fight um right. well you have well that's i was i would ask you i, I i'll bring something up before I, when i was doing if i let's say i started out in music videos then i moved into commercials i hadn't done any feature films yet so my vision is based on what i've done before um i'm seeing commercials probably as commercials are but as you move into film and you start to get much bigger budgets and you're doing huge sets, you try and force that back on the commercial people. You say, well, look, you hired me. This is what I do. Can I give you some of these ideas? Let's think big. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have the courage and the conviction to do that 15 years ago. Um, you know, I've become a little bit more bold as I've gotten older. So I will, I will push my ideas on the director. I will speak up and, you know, I'll, I'll give them massive reference books that I never used to do because I'm so used to doing that on feature films, you know, putting together huge PDFs, et cetera. 
So I don't mind. I, I do. I try to force my will on and see if any of it gets accepted. Um, there's another commercial we're going to look at in a little bit where everything I'm saying now starts to make more sense because we had a very receptive sure agency. Sorry. Very, yeah, very receptive young agency who want, who's the, the brand we were dealing with is probably the biggest in the world. So they wanted something exciting. Um, yeah. And they hired this, this director, Floria Sigismondi on that again. And I was very fortunate to be asked to come and join the journey. And we came, we came up with some outrageous ideas and they, they bought into it. And each day when they would come to set, and it was a, I think it was a nine day shoot. We went down to Mexico city and built everything there. Every day they would, they would literally joyous. They would come up and say, this is better than the day before. And you felt really vindicated. And I think they felt vindicated that they took a chance because it was a little bit unusual for what they'd been doing up to that time. And what the commercial is about, it's about people with small businesses and, and how they can grow their small businesses. And that was the premise behind everything. And this, this first still here, you, you see a bus, a yellow bus, a very surreal bus driving along a street. And as and there's a woman, this lady in the red dress, she's standing inside in between the two rows of seats. The bus suddenly splits in half. It splits in two. And we realize we're on a blue track and these skaters come flying by. So you realize you're going into a very surreal world. You think, you know, you think you're starting off in a mundane setting, somebody on the bus waiting to get home. And then here we are. And she's and she's holding cupcakes. <laughs> this, this is um this is about a, a cupcake business and there's basically ideas that go through the whole um this was a giant sewing machine because we had a sewing business that we were relating this to and what happens is that chap went through and you can't see it but the um the sewing needle was working going up and down um and uh it was quite it was this was all this was all good fun ideas it was come up with something interesting so this was for uh this was meant to be for a nail salon hence it's an abstract version so we we sculpted the hands we have the nails and we added these colors which are a little bit very sort of verna pantone-esque you know the designer from the 60s and there's there were dancing squids in there too just to make it even more ridiculous um and then the dancers are in that same set and each one of them wore an outfit that matched the colors on the walls or well, i think actually what really happened was i had to match the colors on the walls to the dresses so um which was much harder and basically we had a telescopic tunnel which is all different colors and i don't know if you any of you know this amazing chilean director Jadorowski, he has um, a movie with this incredible rainbow uh, colored hallway and that was what inspired us but instead of this being stationary the whole thing folded up like a telescope and we had it on wheels and it was gradually pulled apart and and it traveled along a floor and the dancers moved along it um, that tunnels to the left of this frame and they come out into the street and they do this big final number uh, where they dance and there's a double helix staircase and the bus is, the bus is driven there and split. Um, it's, it's, it's colorful, it's rainbow. -esque. And again, I was thrilled to be doing this because it's a very unusual type of commercial to do. And they took a chance. I think this was like one minute, 49 seconds long. Um, a lot, and th that's a, uh, that's a bird's eye view of the staircase you can see it's double helix so it goes down two different ways and you can see the buses and the edge of the corridor and i remember we shot we shot on this road for the entire day until they got it right lots of shots i, I stood on top of the staircase it was terrifying <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a lot of fun up there <laughs> and that yeah and i had trouble getting down I, I sort of got stuck and said can someone come and help me anyway good day
it was a good day we shot in mexico city and it was it was a blast i had a marvelous time you've mentioned, you've mentioned a lot of exciting cities rome and even los angeles where you are in mexico city you seem to travel around a lot um is that something that's kind of common in uh in doing commercials is going along to different cities have you been all over what's, no, what's i mean it's just last year it's, i i mean it's funny I've, I've been doing a lot of films recently and i kind of got seduced back into the commercial world last year and, and the great thing about it was i was able to stay home and spend some time with my family but i mean like i said i did get to go away last year you know i went to rome and i went to rome twice and i went to mexico city yeah i it's it's true and i tell you i tell you there have been changes i mean there are a lot of you know a lot of countries in europe are really becoming places to go to like serbia um the you everyone a lot of people were going from la to the ukraine they were going to kiev and yeah. it was to build you could build big sets um and los angeles is so rotten i mean it's a union town um and the cost of building big sets there have become prohibitive because of the unions so whereas all the all the commercial bills before were non-union it changed it changed the last few years um and often you find that when you when you're building something that is voluminous you have to leave you have to leave los angeles you have to really leave america you got to go to mexico or you got to go to europe so that's there will you know a lot of production designers will be traveling they won't be traveling they don't travel with you know the crews don't go with them that's that's a, you know that's always the hardest thing i mean i'm in philadelphia right now i've never met any of the people i'm working with you know and they have they have a union out here which is very strong and everyone has to be hired from that union so um every, I, I met everyone for the first time i wasn't able to bring anyone from los angeles uh but yeah the traveling's there and i mean it, it's it's nice it's great it it's fantastic to see these places yeah it really is but you if any of you do commercials you know the time you spend working each day is prohibitive to you really going to see those cities and yeah you don't get the weekend off you're there to work and then you fly back home and also finding resources uh like um, i'm currently in budapest um filming an american show and uh and and just like you i wasn't able to take anybody from america or england i'm dealing with all hungarian crew um and i'd say maybe 60 percent of them speak english the other 40 percent don't and we're doing a lot of charades and drawing and using google translate and everything you find a way to communicate with people it's all about visual i mean that's our job is to is to communicate something visual but one of the biggest problems that i have is like where do i hire something where can i get something where do i go buy a strand of fairy lights i mean where is there fairy lights in this town um there's like it's those things because come when you're working in los angeles you're working on in, in um, london you know you've got the big prop stores you go up to omega you go up to super hire you go wherever and you know exactly where to get whatever you need here there are none so right. have you have you um i would love to hear some of your creative problem solving solutions yeah. and, i, I got to check my and, super yeah, sorry, sorry, Blair, sorry, sorry. My, my supervising art director in Rome, Massimo, couldn't speak a word of English. Oh, it's he common. A bloody word. So, um, you know, I'd be grabbing crew members, come over here, help me, you know, but it was all right. We got through it. It was all good. And it was a lovely chat, lovely chat. Um, I had a supervising art director named Massimo when I worked in Rome. I wonder if it's the same guy. No, Santa Marco, Massimo Santa Marco. It is the same guy. I didn't speak yeah, English. His wife, the, his wife is the set decorator. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but she did speak English. She was okay. She didn't bloody speak English to me. Anyway, oh, no. okay. I had his assistant art director. Franco would speak all the English. And okay. there, was, there was a scenic. Oh, it's Massimo. How funny. How brilliant. So it's a small world. Uh, oh, gosh. Problem. Yeah, problem solving. You know, you, you get London's. I mean, I've shot a couple of films recently in London, you know, and I, and I always try and go out with a set decorator and go around. because I don't really know the lay of the land that well as far as the prop houses. So I like to go out with them and just see what's going on. That's, all, that's always good for me, just to see what's available. Um, so I'm not totally reliant on someone. Um, 
a lot of cities, I, I, I become very reliant on my art director or my set decorator to get me what I'm looking for. I don't know where to find these things. So, I mean, the, those, as far as getting set dressing, I mean, that's something that changes wherever I, wherever I go. It's, uh, um, and if, and if, if I'm there for a very short time, like the Gucci, there w I mean, I'm very, I didn't leave the stage. I'm very reliant on everyone. I'm just there doing the sketches and worrying about the designs getting executed. Um, yeah, As, obviously working at home in LA is by far the easiest place, but uh, the, the whole, this whole, the whole art department is globalized now. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's changed. It's changed the last 10, 15 years. We're working all over the world and it's, it's what it is. And it's never going to go back to as it was. And as we globalize all around the world, I, I mean, I tell everyone back in, I tell everyone in LA, don't get complacent. I said, I work with crews in England. They're just fantastic. They're young, they're diligent, and they're passionate. And they're way more passionate than any of you are. <laughs> love their jobs. Um, and, I, and I said, what, what has happened in London or England the last 15 years? The growth there has been incredible. I mean, it's, it's literally, you know, it's one of the great places to go to the film. I said, that's happening everywhere else, I said. And all these other places are going to come. They're going to come. And, you know, we don't know what's, you know, Greece is on the map now. They're, they're pulling in jobs. Serbia, they're all getting better. They're getting, and in Prague has always had fantastic artisans. Um, I'm, I'm just a big fan of what I see going on elsewhere. I, I, I'm not one of these people who goes, oh, wow, it's all about LA. It's not. Everywhere's caught up. You know, everywhere's caught up. Um, and I, I'm, I mean, I'm curious to see where this is going to take us in the, this business in the next 10 years. I, I feel it's actually, if you're young and you're coming into the film business right now, whether it's commercials, music videos or features, it's very, very exciting. You know, there is, I feel like so, so many amazing things are going to happen. And there are so many amazing projects out there across the board. And I mean, you, considering how things have gone and the fact that yes we are so global and that means even our audiences and the people who are digesting what we're doing isn't it isn't just a small insulated market anymore i mean we are we we as humanity have started to homogenize um it must really affect how you're pitching things and how you're 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 stemming the tide of whatever it is you're doing i mean it has this globalization of crew and and product and, and demographic and everything has that changed your design process in any drastic ways adapting to the business as it is now no no um uh, honestly Blair it's uh, still the same um, and I'll tell you something I started 1998 doing this and there was no www um, <laughs> all, all I had you know as, as a production designer all we had were books and we all started collecting vast libraries I mean I have 4,000 books at home it's my 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 process has always been the same it's it's I go I don't go to the computer, I go to my books. I go to my photographers, my history books, my architecture books, my art books. That's, that's always been where I start. That's my genesis. And, you know, um, and I know the names of photographs, photographers, and obviously I go online. I tell you what changed in the old days. In the old days, you had to stick the book on a, on a copier and copy the picture so you could take it. And I got lazy at that. So I just, I, I just used to open up the back of the car and just stick boxes of books in, you know? Um, and I, I swear, I'm not an old bloody line. I could be carrying 300 pounds worth of books because there might be one picture in that book and I'm too lazy to go and stick it on the copier because that takes a bit of time. And I would have to, <laughs> I'd have to go meet the director or I'd have to go do a pitch with the director in front of the agency. So there was Reed wandering around with these stacks of books, lugging these big boxes like a fool. So I, I don't do that. I don't put the books in the car anymore. But I, if you, when a job starts, you'll see next to my desk, you'll see a huge pile of books getting taller and taller that I'm, <laughs> you know, that I'm pulling stuff from. And then I go to the computer when I have all those assembled. And what I don't have to do now is I don't have to put the book, I just pull the, the image offline online you know and then i build i build my pdfs and obviously I, yeah 
go ahead I, I still have a massive stack of books yeah, as well. yeah. i find yeah. you, you can go on pinterest you can go online but the things are starting to be samey samey so i like i've seen things that have been scanned and you're the only one that has them so there is that element yeah and people you know young art directors have said how did you what do you put what word do you put in to get all these images like how oh, i don't like the decibel system I know the name of the photographers. I just go and Google the photographer that picture, and you can go, oh, okay. So um, I, I find that sometimes I, when I have gone online, you go down a wormhole. Um, it doesn't mean you're not going to find something fantastic, but you could get lost. You could get lost in a computer. And I know I've I've read some interesting things from researchers, you know, who work work for art departments, and they've had moments where they've brought in uh, stacks of books. And they've shown them to the production designer, and the production designer is not interested. If it's not on the if if it's not on the computer, they don't yeah. want to know. That's and that's just, hey, that's just that's it. You're losing, you're you're cutting half the world off for you, from your you know from what you could do. And there's a there's a Argentine writer called Louis Borges, and he says your memory is your imagination, and I don't know what that means, but to me that means everything you've consumed in your life in a book with putting your head against the window when you're driving around in a strange city just staring at all the monuments that's your memory that's everything's being collected and you're all very visual so your your trans every image that you see in your life you're translating it in your own way and it's going into your brain and i think that's what he means by the greater that memory becomes the better chance you have to pull stuff out for your for your imagination um and there is i i i like to mix elements i mean david bowie's the great example of a guy who stole from so many different places and created one thing whether it's a thin white duke or aladdin sane that, that's an amalgamation of his imagination at work and he created something from it so uh i'm i'm a i'm a big fan for having a massive library if that's where all your money goes it's it's the best thing uh, uh so the books um uh th th when i read that from borges it kind of resonated with me that it, it's it is about as i've got a little bit older i think my designing's improved i think um i think i'm i'm getting better at it you know my my vision is growing so i put that down just to life's experience you know um and reading more books and i know it's crazy that there's no pictures in the book so you're imagining those worlds it's great so when you read a script when you read a film script that world bounces out at you you get a vision immediately you know um so i find i i i, I always try to read something it's important to me as opposed to just looking at pictures um and then you know the sketching side of it I, I'm not a big, I, you know, if you ask me that I don't know my, I don't do Rhino. I try to learn Maya and I, I lost my mind. I, <laughs> I tried, I tried Maya, I gave up, you know, um, I don't do Rhino and I use SketchUp very rarely. I, I still prefer to do line drawings to start out, just draw it, just draw it on pencil on a piece of paper and then, you know, get, get into Photoshop like I got behind me. But, uh, I, I know a lot of people, I, I get resumes from young, young art directors um, and they, they, know, they know 10 or 13 programs and, you know, they want to be a production designer and, and I try to advise them. It's great that you're becoming technically brilliant. and That's fantastic. But I said, you'll end up working for a production designer. You won't, you know, they'll, they'll have you doing all that stuff they don't want to do. I said, you've got to be working on that imagination not not the technical stuff but I, maybe i'm saying that because i'm just not very good um if maybe if i was really good at maya i'd be saying yeah fantastic but i'm not you know you'd just be geeking out you'd be, you'd be yeah. in the zone and you get nothing done and and, and they have another name for it in, in Mary. they call them yeah what do they call them they call them cad monkeys okay okay so sorry it means somebody who's brilliant at, at cad you know, and they they just they're just they're just left in front of the computer. They're so amazing they can't get away from it. That's all. So be careful what you become good at. 
I would like you to show us something, uh, speak another part of um, a, another different type of advertising, advertising in artist. And you have done a beautiful Katy Perry music video where you've merged a lot of stuff in, the, in real life and <clears throat> they put a lot of digital cat and monkey stuff in the background. I would yeah, love for you to tell yeah. me, this is just a visual feast. Yeah. I mean, I love everything about this. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. No, thanks, Ben. No, thank you for those kind words. Um, just to everyone, this is a set. This is a practical set. Everything here is made. You know, um, the environment she's in, it was all built on stage. Um, yeah. um, basically, and all the hieroglyphics, we, we painted all those, etc. cetera. Um, and I'm not sure. I. I was going to tell you where I got my inspiration from this. It was actually from a couple of Victorian artists. One is called... Um, Not Egyptian. It? Sorry? Not Egyptian, but Victorian. Oh, I didn't look at any Egyptian architecture for this. Ah. Because I did not. Because these artists, they created this one, Lawrence Alma Tadema. He was a Victorian artist. He created what he imagined ancient Rome, ancient Greece, Egypt looked like, and he did them with these incredible colors. Um, if you look at, I liked his vision. I liked the way he imagined things. And there was another guy called Edward Longacre. He did the same thing. He imagined these worlds, how they really were. Um, and they're stunning. And that's, that, those are, that's, where I, that's where I got my genesis. That, that's what I sold to the director. And, you know, and he, he loved it. And that's where we got these pinks from was um actually from edward longacre um yeah and, uh, as you can see in the distance through the columns there the pink columns that's yeah. all oh, right. the sky and the sand dunes those were all done by very clever vfx people yeah but uh yeah this was this was interesting this was um this was a fun job and again we sculpted these creatures and she sits on them and dances and and then we made made a sarcophagus yeah and then we, we made this silly chariot that's right yeah the chariot um and what's what's happening is these gentlemen she's looking for a husband and these suitors are coming by and they're offering her chariots and wealth and they're not going very it's not going very well so she turns them into things like chihuahuas and that was, that was kind of, <laughs> and then this is this was a drawing for her that was a drawing for the chariot um and the one before was her was katie perry standing. and this was this is how we imagine the world it obviously changed a little bit but this was my initial initial sketch and then it it went to this slightly more hieroglyphic more pink world and that's basically a, a pencil sketch of what we built the set with the with the sphinx and everything there with that she sits where her throne is a lot of, a lot of fun a lot of fun and i think what do we shoot it we shot it in two days oh so my then, goodness how long did that take you to prep i think the whole job i'll tell you what it was, i had 10 day prep on this wow i can't yeah i can't do this stuff anymore <laughs> it's very hard to do it's very hard to do but it was it was it was it was hard yeah and that was it. But I, I, I enjoyed the final, the final edit. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's a fun video, and I think it's had something like two billion, two billion views on YouTube. It's one of the most viewed music video ever. So wow. yeah, so okay. it was a lot of fun. A lot, everyone, everyone had a great time on it. Yeah, it, it really captures Katy Perry as well because she has that like bigger than life, super yeah. saturated candy colors and. Mm -hmm. You just, it, it was exotic and Egyptian, but then again, you picked kind of her palette and her style and packaged it beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, she, 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 she was fine. She didn't complain. She was, she seemed happy with it. She seemed to be having a good time. Yeah. Enjoying, enjoying the fun. Um, could we talk about some of your feature film work a little bit and uh, how it's changed? Um, how you perceive it and how you how it affects your vision for commercials now that you've gotten a couple of feature films under your belt sure. processes or the money or the, any of the things that might come into play yeah um well obviously every time i've been i've, I've had a job 
to do a music video or a commercial, I've never had to pitch to a director. They just reels your website goes in, you know, and and they'll they'll pick somebody, and you never know why they picked you, or it could have been one job that they liked, or you always wonder like, am I the horse for the course? With the filming, with the filming, it's you know you interview now and then you scramble to put a PDF together. So the research I have to do over two or three days to get to the director to try and get the job has changed the work I would put into a commercial. You know, I, I put more in on the front end now when I get the job. I'm much, what's the word? Uh, I'm more careful, more, uh, I, want, I, I want to show more. I don't go in to accept what that, what that director seems to think he wants. I try to show him what I think he might want. And that comes from doing the feature films, where the, however much of the vision the director feels they have, they want they want a compadre, they want somebody to elevate what they have, and you know, my job is the sets, so I need to take whatever ideas they have for their environments, you know, as far as they can. So that was something. It, I I've suddenly realised what a lazy designer I'd been. <laughs> you know just doing the commercials i wasn't i put way more effort in if i do a commercial i put way more effort into trying to come up with a look than i ever did before and that's because of the feature films because you know you're competing against other people who are bloody good it's just you want your vision to be the one that the you know director chooses so you can get to work on that particular film so yeah I, it's it's I work harder, you know, I work harder. And um, the people I I work with on film make me work harder. The people in my departments, whether the art directors and set decorators, they demand more and they demand more from me. So it's it's woken me up to just trying to be a better production designer. Not the one that started out doing music videos, and not the one that started out um, you know doing commercials because i think sometimes that work can be a little bit late i i i mean i think feature films are is the pinnacle of work um and, and I mean, space as well you've got to keep the ideas coming you can't just you know, blow them all in like a oh, shoot. and I, I like the fantasy stuff more than than anything i mean i love the period um uh, but fantasy and and this film gretel and hansel is you know it's a retelling of you know the grim fairy tale except it's gretel now has the empowerment she's the female she's the strong character and we see when we meet the witch she realizes when she meets the witch in this how she can carve out her own future as a as a female um because obviously i heard that Grell and Hansel was originally came from a, a story. It was a war in Germany, the Thirty Years' War, where they had a great famine in Germany and they lost something like eight million people. And the story that the Grimm brothers picked up on there was a, a lady who was who had a gingerbread recipe, and it was supposedly a married a young married couple kill her and steal her gingerbread recipe so they can go into business. I heard that this is where Gretel and Hansel comes from. I don't know how right I am, but um, it's this film, the sets, there's, there's a lot of chronological inconsistency from me because um, it's fantasy though. Yeah, it's fantasy. And, the director, and he said, no, you can't do Arthur Rackham illustrations. You've got to do which, you're, you're, yeah, which and we know he's a brilliant man and he inspires the grim stuff. But so that's why everything here is very is very dark and diff, different. And her house, the witch's house here, is supposed to supposed to be like a, what you call it, uh, the an airplane, uh, an American a military airplane. I've forgotten the word, a, a stealth bomber. Mm -hmm. uh, and the witch, the witch is a cannibal. She's addicted to having, you know, she's addicted to eating children. She has a disease. So we, we pictured her house as a stealth bomber that she just travels around the universe in when she looked trying to feed. 
Um, and the interesting thing about the witch, who's the sort of core character, is she has this addiction and she has to live with it. She has to live with it through, through that. This addiction she has to cannibalizing children is obviously, she knows it's a disease and it's eating away at her. You know, there is humanity in this. It's, she's just not an outright evil malevolent. I mean, she is evil malevolent, but there's a, there's a reason behind her. She has an addiction and she suffers through this. And the, the actress who played her, I think, did a fantastic job. But the thing is, Gretel comes along and sees the strength and the independence in this witch that wouldn't have been prevalent amongst young women back in those days. They would have done what they were told to do. And I think the film has a lot to do with that, about, you know, feminist empowerment. And I think that's really important. Um, this is a gentleman, she, at the beginning of the film, she goes to get a job. Her parents send her off to get a job from this gentleman. And we portrayed him as the kind of guy who might have had a pornographic empire that is no longer doing very well. And it's, it's kind of fallen on hard times. And that's why he's got this decaying room. And the reason for those color stained glass windows were we, we were trying to sum up the idea of going to a red light district. Um, um, so he's, look, he, he's, he does, he's not even wearing trousers. He has, you can see his socks. He's got those little, one little garters to keep his socks up. So he's fallen on hard times and he's, and he's looking for a housekeeper. But um, the director and I, talked about this um, and I, I had a name for him and I'm not going to say it because it would be rude on on during this conversation but we had a nickname for him that we used to laugh about but he's definitely in the pornography empire and it's he doesn't have any more carpets he sold you know he's not doing very well and that's and that's what his job was that's how he made his money once upon a time and then this is I got one of the shots in in the kitchen of the witch's house can it can it go because there's something i like about the the is those those cutouts on the wall those were in it's meant to be a hunting scene um and it's a mural and those were inspired by matisse's cutouts you know uh and basically we took some hunting scenes from some great paintings and just turned it into a more abstract you know vision um, and that's what those are those are meant to be trees and then you see little guys are you know hunters as archers um and that's her and that, i think that was a still that was probably a publicity still it wasn't actually a shot from the movie but a uh, fantastic set decorator fantastic irish crew um, brilliant carpenters amazing plasterers we um so this was this was an absolute thrill to work on and the director director's name is um osgood perkins and just for a little bit of history his father's anthony perkins the great yeah. Anthony perkins yeah that's his dad um and Os osgood's probably one of the loveliest directors i've ever met in my life um and when you meet him you fall in love with him um, and i'm not he's just that man he's just that special and i'm hoping we get to do stuff again in the future he's, he's got some very cool things that are very close to happening but i'm not going to talk about them but they're great he's he's a wonderful guy great ideas he writes as well um so this this was thrilling um, and it was my first time working in ireland and i went back just a, a year ago to do something with floria which is set in um sort of norman england in 1280 and uh, because of all Oliver Cromwell burnt down everything in Ireland, none of this stuff exists, which is great. So we got to build everything. I really like how uh, in uh, Gretel and Hansel, you took this story um, and made it not modernized it, but put it in a logical form. Yeah. Like um, you've you motivated and validated through like the the instead of going through the forest, you've got the cutouts on the wall, and you know, and, and instead of just this random, oh, this is a witch that eats children, you, it's an addiction. It's like any other kind of addiction. It's um, put it in a human form, and yeah. I really saw that in the design, like the the brutalist sort of 
uh, architecture, the shingles that still somehow in a way look like a gingerbread house, but it's even more menacing and more um, relatable to, you know, the, the, the darkness and the, like the really sincere darkness that the world has kind of come to now. You, that yeah. you design's beautiful that way. Thank you, thank you. I mean, this, those, those little steps in the house, there were a couple of things that I like. One is the Giant's Causeway, you know, in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Way. And the other one is, is the Jewish Holocaust uh, Museum. I can't remember the name of the, the architect. Oh, gosh, I wish I could pull it up. But he has these steps. They're all, um, you know, uneven, uneven squares. And the, the whole thing about the witch's house was we lo I looked at malevolent architecture. So I looked at um, Albert Speer, Hitler's guy, you know, his use of space. And I looked at all the uh, the stuff that Mussolini built and how he tried to bring back all, you know, all the, fed all the, all the, you know, the greatness of the, of Rome. Um, I think it was, oh God, it was a little bit of futurism and rationalism, if I remember. That was the the name for the architecture when Mussolini was doing it because he was combining modern with Rome modern architecture with Rome and changing things and there had to be some rationalism behind the ideas but though the, the the steps on the house that's th those were the things that I pulled from um the a-frame is is pulled from modern architecture it's also from Nordic architecture uh yeah it, and and also if you look at the layout of the house it's a bit like a post and beam house from Southern California yes I've seen that, actually yeah. Uh, the, it is okay it is so it's got a little bit of california from the 1970s and house and, and yeah your parents probably got one like that and you probably, yeah. anyway yeah and also the interiors you know we i looked at a lot of the the, the quakers uh, the mennonites um and the puritans and everything that went on you know on, in new england in the late 1600s and what they brought from England, their you know their, their architecture and their bareness of you know things like they would put their their chairs, they would have pegs along the walls, and they would put, take the chairs from around the table and stick them on a peg on the wall, so it looked like the chairs floating. But anyway, so uh, those were that was another. There were a lot of little hodgepodge of stuff. Like I said, chronologically, it's very inconsistent. So you could take me to, you could tell me off for that. No, I would never uh, tell you off. You're, uh, I mean, I, I broke all but I had a bit of fun. You're a great rule breaker and you am amalgamate so many different things to be, I mean, this industry is about rule breaking and it's about telling different fragmented stories. And especially as it relates to commercial, it's trying to find a way to make maybe a boring product actually really interesting or memorable, do you know? And you've done a great job and you've given all these people a lot of inspiration because I know that, uh, you know, commercials is a really good way for somebody to kind of, get in and do a bite-sized piece of something super magical where you don't have to invest and commit such a thing and there's independent low budget commercials where you can get your feet wet with trying something adventurous and you've been a great source of inspiration to everybody here on here and i just can't thank you enough well thank you I mean, that's incredibly kind of you thank you I'm, I'm excited to be here and i'm excited to do what i do yeah. Oh, we're excited for you and congratulations again on winning the, the best production design for the BFDG for your Gucci Aria. Of course, thank you. Really give him a little bit of a hand. <laughs> Thanks Sorry. for everybody here. I think we have to wrap things up yeah. now, okay. unfortunately. Sorry if, I went on. Sorry if I went on a bit, everyone. But uh, No, no, you're brilliant. You're just absolutely brilliant. I, I, was hope that, I hope there's one or two things that you might find, that I said that you might find interesting and worth taking with you. But anyway, I'm, I speak from my heart. Uh, and the thing is, I, I, I think I never really worked for anyone when I came in. I came in and saw, I sort of, oh gosh, I, I think I figured out what was going on. And I thought I could do it because it was everything I, I was in love with. And I thought it was just a case of putting my ideas. And that's why, you know, I started out with very, the worst, the tiniest budget music videos that nobody else wanted to do. And I'm so glad I did and you know i've just followed my own instincts the whole the whole way that's fantastic your instincts are fantastic and you've done brilliant work with them all all right thank you ben. thank you it's been a lot of fun
All right, great. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you guys, everybody, for tuning in and listening to the wonderful Jeremy Reed, uh, who's absolutely fantastic. And if there is more information that you would like about the BFDG, you can find all the benefits of individual, corporate, educational memberships and learn about more chats that we're having like this at the website britishfilmdesigners.com. So I hope that you'll all join me on the website and, and uh, in another one of these beautiful chats where we can learn more about the industry and I hope that you all found something helpful and for your own career in this. Thanks a lot for everybody coming. And I'm Blair Barnett. I'm the chair of the BODG. So, hi. Forget about myself. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody.